On this edition of Exposé, enter the shadowy world of government contracting and find out what they don't want you to know. Funding for Exposé has been provided by This is the Washington we all see, the seat of government, the symbols of America, icons of democracy. But there is another Washington few of us know. In the shadow of the Capitol, private contractors thrive on public money. Many of the names are familiar. But you've likely never heard of the multi-billion dollar company that has received more private government contracts than any other. A recent magazine investigation revealed whether or not this company delivers on its promises, it always seems to fly under the radar and it always gets paid. We'll tell you who it is in a moment. But first, the magazine doing the investigating. It's brassy, flashy, and sexy. As for Vanity Fair's investigators? Don and I have actually been a team now for 36 years. So does that, does that make sense? Sounds good to me. As long as it's not me driving the truck. They're a special breed just because they're so old school. Um, and I, they've been together longer than most marriages have lasted. And they've got this wonderful name, Bartlett and Steele. I mean, it's sort of a throwback to Addison and Steele. So they're sort of perfect for the magazine world. Let's see here. Don Bartlett and Jim Steele have long made it their business to fill us in on what those in power would rather we didn't know. This is our archive. These things are all files from projects dating back to 1971. They've exposed everything from dangerous plans for nuclear waste disposal to inequitable tax policies to price gouging by big oil. Along the way, they have earned two Pulitzer Prizes and a reputation as one of America's most dogged investigative reporting teams. What's their secret to staying together so long? We're both very boring. I mean, uh, who else reads the tax code? The tax code, court documents, corporate filings, government contracts. For Barlett and Steele, these are all must-reads. And it was by chance while slogging through a Homeland Security contract on another story that they came across the name of the biggest defense contractor you've never heard of. Science Applications International Corporation, SAIC. It is the country's ninth largest federal contractor with 44,000 employees over half of them with security clearances. For Barlett and Steele, investigating SAIC meant more than just looking at one company. It was a chance to do what they do best, to look at the big picture. In this case, how Washington and private contractors really interact and operate. Most of the big issues that aren't being discussed are really completely legal. It's not just somebody who had their hand in the cookie jar. Now, that's bad. But it's all of these perfectly legal uh, events that go on from, by lobbyists, by influence peddlers, by congressmen and senators who um, slip things into bills as a favor to constituents. And this is the way so many systems operate. Barlett and Steele read everything they could find on SAIC. They began connecting dots to create an image of Washington insiders moving smoothly between the company and the federal government, with implications for public policy. One connection involved a well-known public figure from the Iraq War, David Kay. 
You might remember Kay as the man who led the search for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, first for the United Nations following the 1991 Gulf War, and again over a decade later for the Bush administration following the 2003 U.S. invasion. In the interim, Kay was a high-ranking official of SAIC. Kay made many appearances in the media prior to the U.S. invasion, in which he insisted that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction and needed to be removed. I don't think it's possible to disarm Iraq as long as Saddam is in power and desires to maintain weapons of mass destruction. Kay wasn't the only person associated with SAIC publicly supporting the push for war. You may also remember retired General Wayne Downing. He spent years on the SAIC board. Our president, the administration, has very, very clearly said that this, this uh, operation with Iraq is about a regime change. It's about toppling the regime. It's about taking, taking that regime out. But here's something about Downey and Kay you probably don't know. Something Barlett and Steele uncovered. Digging through obscure company documents, Don Barlett discovered that as an SAIC director, Downing had amassed tens of thousands of shares of SAIC stock. And in an interview, David Kay told Barlett that he too had received shares in the company. And so here you had two SAIC people with stock in the company, which would only go up with war, urging war. And uh, the, the average American citizen did not know this. Not a clue. The news media said nothing about it. After the U.S. invasion, David Kay appeared on NBC News, trumpeting the discovery of what he described as a mobile weapons lab. This vessel is the fermenter. You took the nutrients, think of it sort of as a chicken soup for biological weapons, you mixed it with the seed stock, the mobile weapons lab turned out to be nothing of the kind. There were no WMD in Iraq. David Kay later went before the Senate to admit his mistake. It turns out uh, we were all wrong, probably in my judgment, and that is most disturbing. Kay called for an investigation into how the intelligence could have been so flawed. Do you believe that those that provided false intelligence estimates ought to be held accountable? Absolutely. And for his honesty, Kay was celebrated in the media. So finally this evening, our person of the week, he has certainly made news this week, and he has done his country and the world a great public service. But Barlett and Steele saw something the rest of the media missed, and it was this. Among the outsiders chosen by the Bush administration to figure out what went wrong, three officials of SAIC. The principals from that company were so instrumental in banging the drum for the whole Iraqi war on what turns out to be totally misguided information about weapons of mass destruction. Then to turn it over to people from that company to explain what went wrong seems absolutely preposterous to me. To the reporters, it was a clear conflict of interest. And so it came as no surprise to them that the investigation would find, quote, no indication that the intelligence community distorted the evidence regarding Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. SAIC has its people on that, on that commission that writes the report that basically um, whitewashes the whole affair. David Kay was just one piece of what the reporters would discover was a much larger puzzle. But to put it all together, Barlett and Steele needed to find a way inside the cloistered world of SAIC. So they went hunting for lawsuits. Unless sealed by a gag order, court records are public. They're where secrets are revealed. And SAIC had been sued for sex discrimination, wrongful termination, falsifying data, defrauding the government. Well, there was a very, very long list of these cases over the last really 15 to 20 years. The number of these filings is totally out of whack. There was too much activity going on that would not be explainable in the course of normal events. Jim Steele began calling the plaintiffs. At first, he got nowhere. I kept trying to get this one woman to talk to me. And I finally said, why, why will you not talk to me? What is it? that you're afraid of. And she paused 
and very slowly she said, this is a very powerful company. After several dead ends, he finally found someone who wasn't too afraid to talk. Somebody made reference to an earlier lawsuit. And when we looked at our listing from the Superior Court in San Diego, we saw it right there by a woman by the name of Bernice Stanfield. Finding Bernice Stanfield in court records was one thing, but getting to her in person turned out to be quite another. We're over yeah. some of the most spectacular country in the world from your house. She now lived in Alaska. So I flew from the East Coast to Anchorage. And it seems so amazing that a lot of this story is going to be up here, not even in Anchorage, but in this little town, not even in this little town, but on this lake north of Anchorage. Bernice Stanfill, now Bernice Stanfill King, was hired in 1972 as just the 218th employee of SAIC. She was laid off in 1987. She filed suit for wrongful termination and after 10 years of litigation won a million dollar judgment against the company. But that wasn't what intrigued Jim Steele. It was what King had in her possession. Jim Steele was, was really excited about all the documents that I have because I have boxes and boxes and boxes of documents. In fact, I'm probably the only person who had every single annual report that was ever produced by SAI. There were two separate trials, substantial depositions, huge amounts of documents produced. Me being a documents reporter, uh, this was, of course, music to my ears. This is the mother load. And you, and you always think, oh, this is great. Over here, we have a person who's scared to death to talk. Now, over here, we have <clears throat> all of these documents. It can't get better than that. King and her documents painted an insider portrait of SAIC, going all the way back to its founding in 1969 by John Robert Beister. Bob Beister was the ultimate authority on everything at SAI. He would, would go on tirade and say, this is my company, we'll do it my way. Beister's way was to tap into the unprecedented demand for private military contractors. With the Vietnam and Cold Wars raging, Beister understood, as Barlett and Steele would later write, that this was the perfect time for shrewd consultants to get into the war business. As long as you could bring in a contract, you had a job at SAI. But the minute you lost your contract, you lost your job. It was general knowledge. From King and her documents, Jim Steele learned that over the years, Beister had stacked his board with Washington heavyweights. Melvin Laird served as Richard Nixon's defense secretary before joining SAIC. William Perry and John Deutsch were on the SAIC board before going on to become defense secretary and CIA director for President Clinton. Admiral Bobby Ray Inman went back and forth, from Vice Director of Defense Intelligence under Gerald Ford to the SAIC board, from SAIC to directing Jimmy Carter's National Security Agency, and serving as Deputy Director of the CIA under Ronald Reagan. And then, back to the board of SAIC. The joke at SAI was that we had enough generals and admirals to start our own war, <laughs> and that was true. When you bring those people into your operation, that gives you access back to the agencies. I mean, it's not just a matter of you're trying to get expertise about what to do and so forth. The whole idea of people coming in really was to bring in contracts. If you put people from private industry into the government and then you welcome them back and you made it lucrative for them, then you always had a friend in high places. All defense contractors try to hire former government officials. But SAIC had something to offer that most of them didn't. Shares in a private stock program, a program managed by Bernice King. As King told Steele, because the stock was not traded on a public market, Beister and his board controlled its price, and it usually moved in one direction, up. I could really get a feeling how that had become such a pivotal factor in the rise of that company, why they had been able to hire so many people out of the military and intelligence, and how many of those people had gotten very, very wealthy as a result of that. 
It was a brilliant business plan, but as Barlett and Steele would write, one that had echoes of a famous warning issued more than 45 years ago by President Dwight Eisenhower. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. And this is just one of these companies. I mean, there are more, and we make that point in the story that, that, that this is not the only defense contract, but this is just emblematic of what's happened. They're functioning on their own. They're totally impervious to really public input. And we as a country have really lost control of this process. This SAIC story, it points to a, an element that most people don't know about, that the we are outsourcing more and more of what we do, especially in the, in the area of, of fighting wars, to private contractors who are, um, um, are unaccountable to the public and um, can largely stay private from sort of the prying eyes of reporters. It's pervasive and it's dangerous, I think. Dangerous, the reporters would learn, because with so much tax money flowing into the hands of private contractors and so little oversight, things can and do go terribly wrong. Exhibit A. In June 2001, the FBI paid SAIC $122 million to create a virtual case file, or VCF, a software program that would speed up the sharing of information among agents. But the FBI abandoned VCF after the software failed to function adequately. When SAIC delivered the first product in December of 2003, uh, we immediately identified a number of deficiencies, uh, 17 at the outset. Uh, that soon cascaded to uh, 50 or more and ultimately to 400 problems with that software. The episode prompted FBI Director Robert Mueller to do what few in government have done, publicly criticize SAIC. Uh, we were indeed disappointed. In response to written questions from Barlett and Steele, SAIC says it had had concerns about the FBI's management of VCF, but failed to adequately communicate them to the agency. But for the reporters, that's the big problem with the current system. It's in the interest of private contractors not to resist, but to comply. Increasingly, there is no one in government with the knowledge that once existed to tell an SAIC, look, what you're doing isn't going to work. This is not what we need. Here, you've got to change directions. Now the government increasingly is totally dependent on the private contractor to do the job right, and increasingly the job is not being done right. Exhibit B. In 2002, the National Security Agency awarded SAIC a $280 million contract to design Trailblazer, a new computer system to help the spy agency better track electronic information. General Richard Hayden was then the director of the NSA. A lot of the failure in the Trailblazer program was in the fact we were trying to overachieve. We were throwing deep and we should have been throwing short passes if you mm -hmm. want to use a metaphor. And that a the contract ballooned to over a billion dollars and in the end it was abandoned. Barlett and Steele note that William Black was in charge of Trailblazer for the NSA. Black had also served four years as a vice president at SAIC. The NSA said little about Trailblazer, but Barlett and Steele uncovered a follow-up contract to produce a less ambitious upgrade of the agency's computer systems. Who got the $360 million payday? The NSA wasn't saying, but once again, Barlett and Steele knew what to read. This time, an obscure corporate filing to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Here is a list of their contracts, one of which is called, I don't know how you even pronounce this, E-X-E-C-U-T-E-L-O-C-U-S, and then in parentheses, formerly Trailblazer Technical Development Program. They screwed up the first project, then they got a second project for the next stage. Succeed or fail, it seems, there's always another payday for private contractors. It was something Bernice Stanfield King says she'd seen often during her time at SAIC.
we could just say, hey, we need some more money, and they just say, okay. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if when, when you you're need some money, you just call up somebody and say, hey, I need some more money, and they'd say, okay. Well, that's essentially what's happening there. As Barlett and Steele note, although 9-11 was a tragedy for America, it was very, very good for defense contractors like SAIC. What you see today is not just the military industrial complex, but the military industrial hyphen counterterrorism complex. And this has got to be Eisenhower's worst nightmare because now the spending is unlimited. In the buildup to war in Iraq, the government awarded SAIC seven contracts without competitive bidding. The contracts had a face value of over a hundred million dollars, but after budget overruns, SAIC would get far more. If the camera is like this, the microphone... One of the more lucrative jobs was to create a media network in post-invasion Iraq. Veteran newsman Don North was hired to train a new generation of Iraqi journalists to provide the nation with something it hadn't seen in 35 years of dictatorship, honest reporting. At first, says North, it was working. You could go to a downtown cafe and you'd find everybody raptly looking at the news and being amazed that... Um, Iraqis were actually being interviewed on the street and could even uh, complain or criticize the United States military or Ambassador Bremer and the coalition provisional authority. But soon it was hard to find pictures like these on the Iraq media network. We started getting directives of what we were going to put on the air and what we were going to cover each day. And it would largely consist of coalition provisional authority, uh, press conferences, photo opportunities, endless press conferences with Ambassador Bremer. What the coalition provisional authority and SAIC established was simply a propaganda station that... Uh, followed the dictates and manipulation of the Bush administration. The Defense Department Inspector General would identify numerous problems with SAIC's handling of the Iraq media network, but not before the contract ballooned to over 82 million of those no-bid dollars. In October 2006, SAIC went public and Wall Street roared its approval. Within two weeks of opening, SAIC's stock price had jumped more than 30 percent. Four months later, the old school duo's 9,000 word investigation of SAIC appeared. It was the March 2007 issue of Vanity Fair, the Hollywood issue. Well, this is probably the one time Barlett and I are going to be on the same cover with Chris Rock and Owen Wilson. Sometimes in James Bond movies or, super, or Superman movies, you, you see there's a moment when somebody pours acid on a piece of, you know, thick steel, and nothing can stop the acid until it goes all the way through. To me, the kind of reporting that uh, Jim and Don do is like that acid. You know, once you set them going, they're going to go all the way through until they have found what needs to be found. As Barlett and Steele report, the revolving door just continues to spin at SAIC. Robert Gates, the current Secretary of Defense, during the 1990s, he served briefly on SAIC's board. And SAIC recently won one of its largest contracts ever, it's to help the Army revolutionize its ground combat forces. One of the key architects of the plan was Army General Daniel Zanini. Who does he work for now? A certain private contractor with deep ties to the national security establishment.
funding for expose has been provided by